Um, so today, I'm going to share a line of our work that's been inspired by the question of how listeners make sense of statistically structured input like speech. And the specific target of learning I'll discuss today is how we acquire categories across um, input like speech. So I don't think I have to work very hard to convince this crowd that the perceptual input um, is highly variable, yet nonetheless also carries rich distributional structure and regularities. And I don't think I'll struggle much to convince you that this structure is learnable. Um, and that learning across statistically structured input can be robust, such that it allows us to generalize to understand new experiences and new events that we've not encountered before. So we can take a look at a picture like this and see you know, that we can group things according to dog versus cat, big versus small, floppy ear versus perky ear, et cetera, et cetera. And you have enough knowledge of the distributional structure of each of these that when I present to you this strange beast, some of you will recognize it immediately. This, of course, is a, a Pittsburgh Steelers show poodle. Most of you have probably never seen one before. Um, for the uninitiated, this is a uh, poodle who's been dyed and dressed to resemble the local American football team in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where my lab is located at Carnegie Mellon University. It is weird, to say the least. Um, but it's nonetheless recognizable as an exemplar of dog. So learning about distributional regularities of dog allows us to generalize the knowledge that we've acquired um, to be able to quickly understand new experiences like this one. So today, I'd like to focus on a curious case um, of a category in which there is statistically structured input, and that input is patterned after a real-world learning challenge um, but that nonetheless presents a, a bit of a puzzle for statistical learning. So my interest in this question comes from the broader issue of how human listeners detect and track and learn across regularities in the auditory modality, particularly with regard to speech. And so let me just give you also a little bit of an early example to understand where we're headed today. So we're all speech experts in this room. Um, I imagine it's a deeply multilingual room, um, but the fact that we can communicate together today at this conference means that we've all aligned on a kind of common parse of the sounds that I'm making right now as English. And it, we're so expert at this, we can just come in, plop into the chairs and begin taking the information from my mind to deliver it to your minds, that it's easy to forget what a challenge this really is. In San Sebastian, you can get an easy um, reminder of this when you fly into the airport and you can't make sense of ask whatsoever. Um, and so I'm going to suggest we save that example for later tonight um, and, and a wander down to Old Town. But as a more expedient example, um, I'd like you to listen to this really brief clip and um, be reminded that when you're listening to foreign speech of which you have no learned representations, it really flies by. It seems to continue without pause. But I'd like you to listen carefully and see if you detect anything. So here's a go. I told her, I my God, I heard one again, I did a submachine gun in a soldier idea fire bomb. Get anything? Anyone who heard anything, raise your hand. Say something like you know. Okay, some of you. I'm going to give you another time, another time of it. Exact same pattern. I told her, I my God, I heard one again, I did a submachine gun in a soldier idea fire bomb. More this time? Not all of you. All right, I'm going to give you a hint now. Okay. I told I, I my God, I heard when I can hold it a submachine gun in a soldier idea fire bomb. Okay, so once once you've latched onto it, submachine gun pops out of this. I think otherwise incomprehensible speech. If you did comprehend it, please find me. I'd love to know what else is going on in there. Um, but from this example, you can really understand the, the immediacy of the mapping that occurs when the acoustics of the input align with the regularities of speech that you've learned across experience. And this is the challenge for learning across continuous, variable, and rapidly evolving speech signals. So once we've learned the mapping, it's almost impossible not to make that connection. Um, but how is this learning accomplished? And this is the question um, that the research I'll talk about today tries to address. Now, what this example also highlights is that for speech, their category learning is embedded in the larger contextual challenge of segmentation learning. So speech is typically presented in a continuous, fluent, 
embedded environment. Um, and this presents a bit of a chicken and the egg problem. If learning takes place across continuous speech in a manner that makes use of statistical regularities across units, it may need to be doing so even as those acoustically variable units are themselves being learned to be representative members of that unit or of that category. So near the end of the talk, I'll return to this larger issue in learning across continuous speech. But for now, to start, I'd like to back up just a bit and tell you about a, the example I mentioned earlier um, of a curious case of a category in which there's statistically structured input um, patterned after a real world learning challenge that represents something of a puzzle. So to get there, let me show you a few of the stimuli. And so here we're gonna step back from speech into an artificial non-speech set of auditory categories. And this is a representative example of the kind of studies I'd like to show you today. The learning challenge here is illustrated here with four categories of artificial non-speech sounds, each plotted in the time on the x-axis by frequency y-axis domain. And each panel, is plotting six exemplars from a novel non-speech auditory category. So for each, there is a constant lower frequency spectral prominence shown by the dotted gray line that's paired with one of the colored, one of the six higher frequency prominences shown with color. So this creates six exemplars per category. Now two of these categories, those to the far left, are designed to possess a simple unidimensional regularity. You can see that those higher frequency prominences all rise in frequency on the far left for A, or all fall in frequency. The other two categories on the right have a more complex acoustic pattern with no single acoustic dimension uniquely defining category membership. The higher prominence sometimes rises, it sometimes falls, sometimes it's nearly flat. Now we've designed these sounds in the lab. They're entirely artificial. Um, they don't sound like speech, and to convince you, I'll just play you one example, because they're a little irritating to listen to over time. Okay, that's probably as much as you want of that. Um, but these non-speech multidimensional onset categories, those two categories to the right of the previous slide, are loosely patterned on the classic lack of invariance challenge in speech acoustics whereby no single acoustic cue uniquely defines a sound as belonging to a particular category. So for example, if we consider the phoneme category D in English, we can examine sounds like D, de, do, and notice that like the non-speech sounds that we've built to model it, sometimes that second higher frequency prominence rises, sometimes it's flat, sometimes it falls. And so like our like speech examples, our non-speech sounds are modeling this issue that not a, no single acoustic dimension is uniquely determining category membership. Now these acoustic characteristics uh, create differences in the baseline perceptual space, the perceptual space that listeners bring with them prior to any training or learning. Lauren Emerson and Ran Liu and Jason Seven did the hard work of mapping the perceptual space for these sounds and they found that the unidimensional offset categories that consistently rise or consistently fall at offset, are, and here labeled as E1 versus E2, are very easily discriminable even prior to learning. But in contrast, the multidimensional category exemplars, here labeled H1 and H2, overlap considerably in perceptual space prior to learning. Yet, despite their complexity, these H1 and H2 categories do in fact have reliable statistical structure. And if you plot the stimulus exemplars in a higher dimensional space that takes into account both the onset frequency and the steady state frequency, the categories are in fact linearly separable in this higher dimensional perceptual space. They do possess statistical structure. So it's curious then that despite the statistical structure, listeners don't seem to pick up upon these categories through passive exposure. Moran, Ran, and Jay exposed listeners to these sounds for nine minutes and found no evidence that this exposure facilitated the perceptual distinctiveness of the H1, H2 categories um, for those multidimensional onset stimuli. Likewise, in an unsupervised sorting task involving the same stimuli, Listeners could pretty accurately sort the unidimensional offset categories, but were extremely poor at sorting multidimensional onset categories 
And this was true um, in the sense that they did not improve after even 30 minutes of exposure to the sounds. So this toy perceptual space, this toy problem modeling some of the acoustic characteristics of speech um, presents something of a puzzle. There is statistical structure in the input, um, and the categories are, in fact, even linearly separable in a higher dimensional perceptual space. But listeners don't seem to be easily picking up upon them via passive listening. In contrast, the simpler structure of the unidimensional offset categories is very readily made use of across passive um, exposure. The puzzle is that the harder onset categories, the H1 and H2 categories, are much more representative of the kind of categories, like speech, that we must learn in the natural world. So if we can't learn these modest simplifications with quite modest complexity, very few exemplars, how does statistically st structure get into the system in auditory learning? So in this regard, our work and that of others has been really focused on two approaches that has been especially common and especially productive for a really long time in understanding speech category learning. When we focus on earlier in the developmental trajectory, people tend to emphasize learning through passive exposure. When we study adults and older children, we've tended to emphasize explicit instruction, such as training with stimulus response feedback paradigms or classroom pedagogy. So the work I'd like to discuss today um, is examining the question of, well, what if there's a middle ground? Um, and I wonder whether we might be able to examine whether learning um, the middle ground between learning via passive accumulation of statistics um, and overt feedback through instruction. So our approach to this puzzle has been to examine more of what the world might have to offer. In learning about statistically structured input, we might imagine that listeners engage in the perceptual world and use statistically structured perceptual information to make predictions and to guide action. Sometimes these predictions are going to have good outcomes. Other times they won't. So quite a while ago now, we began to seek ways to understand how these aspects of learning in the natural world might intersect with statistical learning about distributionally structured input. Let me underscore that what I'm about to say is not to deny the existence or the importance of learning across either passive exposure or explicit instruction, but only to examine the possibility that listeners might have more tools in their learning toolbox, that they might be able to fill the gaps when learning seems either neither wholly explicit nor easily accommodated by passive exposure to the input. So, we began with the prediction that alignment of statistical regularities with multimodal events and active behavior might support learning about statistically structured input. And our approach has been to build a virtual world that embodies some of these elements. It's a, oops, it's a simplification for sure. This started a little prematurely, but let me show you what I mean. Um, the studies I'll talk about today use a custom video game and in the game, participants' explicit task is to navigate through a space-themed virtual world, targeting alien ships with a laser as the ships appear. Players are not explicitly instructed to form audiovisual or auditory motor um, associations, and they're not told of the significance of the sounds. They do not overtly make sound categorizations until a surprise post-training labeling task. So they're not receiving, they're not making explicit category decisions, nor receiving explicit feedback about the categories. They have no knowledge of how many categories there are, or that in fact there are categories to be learned. And with that, I'm going to try to mute this. Okay. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, so listeners are performing this primary task, space navigation. Um, that's ostensibly unrelated to auditory categorization. But crucially, the way we've built this game is that the auditory category exemplars are aligned with the primary task goals, the space navigation goals, so that listeners might capitalize on the statistical structure of the categories that they're experiencing in order to drive efficient and accurate behavior in that primary task. So there's several game mechanics that strongly promote auditory category learning. And firstly, 
each spaceship is associated with a particular sound category, so that each time that ship appears, a randomly selected acoustically variable sound exemplar from the category is associated um, and played repeatedly until the user aims the laser and executes an action on that alien. Secondly, each ship originates from a consistent quadrant of visual space with some jitter. This makes it possible to set the laser's range even before a ship appears, but only if one can identify the upcoming ship's quadrant using the sound category that predicts the ship. So thirdly, as the game progresses, the speed and the difficulty of the game increases, as it tends to do in video games, so that ultimately, um, oops, ultimately quick identification um, helps you in your space navigation task. Near the higher levels of the game, you can actually hear the aliens before you see them, and thereby it, it greatly supports behavior and success. At the highest game levels, you must rely on auditory categorization. So back to our puzzle of the statistically structured non-speech categories that prove to be difficult to learn via passive exposure. Let me share the behavioral segment of a neuroimaging study I'll come back to in just a bit. We had young adult participants play the video game for 36 minutes in the fMRI scanner. They were then engaged in an explicit labeling task outside the scanner in which we asked them to match the sounds that they'd heard in the game to the alien ships. And they also attempted to match novel sound exemplars not experienced in the game. Here I'm plotting the behavioral post-test results for the H1, H2 categories that are difficult to learn via passive exposure. The incidental alignment of acoustically variable sound exemplars with consistent behaviorally relevant actions and events in the space navigation task is sufficient to drive learning in a domain where learning was not apparent um, across comparable time periods of passive exposure. Note here that we see robust learning for the familiar trained examples as well as generalization to the novel examples. So the dark blue line there is the Pittsburgh Poodle example. These are sounds that the listeners had never encountered in the video game, but were nonetheless category consistent. And they were able to learn robustly enough to be able to generalize this learning when encountering new examples at test. So it appears that learning auditory categories difficult to acquire across passive exposure is assisted by the alignment of categories with behaviorally relevant actions and events. This suggests that incidental learning of this sort might give a bit of a boost to learning across input that's otherwise difficult to acquire through passive accumulation of statistical regularities via exposure alone. But you might ask whether this learning is really statistical. And I figured I'd be asked that at this conference. So does the statistical structure of the input really matter to influence incidental learning? So to that point, um, we had another group of listeners experience the same exact sound exemplars as the one we've just discussed. So we've so far discussed this experimental group where there's an orderly statistical structure. A control group heard exactly the same easy offset categories, identical in both acoustics and statistical structure to those heard by the experimental group. But for the onset categories, they were identical in the acoustics across groups, but they differed in their statistical structure. Recall that the experimental group onset categories possessed possess distributional structures such that they were linearly separable in a higher dimensional perceptual space. We destroyed that relationship for the control group. They had identical stimuli, but each group experienced a consistent mapping of category exemplars to specific actions and events but those category exemplars exhibited more or less statistical structure um, according to group. So when we come back to the uh, post-scanning behavioral results, you recall we saw robust learning for the experimental group, but the statistical structure impacted this learning. Have, even though they were well-matched on stimuli um, and identically matched on task, and there was always a consistent mapping, having less statistically structured input took a hit on learning um, for the R control group. So the statistical structure matters. Learning is contingent upon the existence of an orderly higher dimensional relationship in perceptual space, just as the sort possessed by speech and many other natural signals. So it does seem that incidental learning is sensitive to the statistical regularity in the input. And I'll have more to say on this in just a bit. But in the meantime, let me try to address the question of what supports this incidental learning. The literature examining the neurobiology of auditory category learning is exceptionally small. 
especially in comparison to its uh, visual category learning cousin. And most of the work has focused on identifying changes in cerebral cortical response to sounds before versus after learning. So as a result, we know really quite little about the learning mechanisms and the associated brain systems that drive these changes in auditory categorization. So for this reason, we sought to use fMRI to examine incidental learning as it happens while participants are playing the video game in the scanner, um, really to watch incidental learning as it's unfolding. So the behavioral data I've shown you so far come um, from participants who played the video game in the fMRI scanner, allowing us to examine online learning. So although we know quite little about the learning mechanisms and associated brain systems that drive changes in auditory categorization, an exception comes from studies of categorization training among adults learning difficult to acquire non-native speech categories. These studies show that explicit training with feedback can provide significantly larger learning gains than those yielded from passive exposure alone. And crucially, this behavioral dissociation is reflected in the striatum during learning. Training with explicit feedback results in striatal activation, whereas training with no feedback does not. Therefore, at least under conditions of explicit training with feedback, the striatum is a likely contributor to successful auditory and speech category learning. So we sought to investigate this here. You know, although our participants in the incidental learning task never get overt explicit feedback and never make overt category judgments, the incidental video game I've described is not entirely feedback free either. Successful navigation in the game is supported by sound categorization and as such uh, supports predictions about behavior and, their co and correspondingly elicits outcomes with value. We sought to examine whether the striatum associated with speech learning via explicit feedback is also similarly engaged in incidental category learning. And indeed, as participants play the game in the scanner, we observe striatal activation in the context of incidental category learning um, without overt category decisions or the existence of experimenter provided feedback. So within a striatum anatomical mask, we observe a set of striatal subregions and they're localized to the left caudate body and bilateral putamen. And they exhibit a group by time course interaction and activation that is time locked to the audiovisual alien trial events experienced during the continuous gameplay in the scanner. Crucially, the striatal re recruitment differs as a function of the statistical structure of the sound categories experienced across those experimental and control groups. The experimental group who experienced statistically structured sounds recruited these striatal regions to a significantly greater degree than the control group. This is another indication that incidental learning is crucially tied to the statistical regularity of the input. This pattern of results is especially striking given the similarities across the experimental and control conditions. Participants played the same game. Um, they experienced the same exact sounds. Um, but they differed in the degree to which the exemplars of those sounds were organized and aligned with behaviorally relevant tasks and events on um, the primary video game task. This had a major influence on the extent to which the striatum was recruited. Moreover, the extent of striatal activation was a really good predictor of behavioral formants in the experimental, but not the control group. For the experimental group, the degree of striatal activation is positively correlated with behavioral measures of incidental learning in both the overt post-test um, post labeling on the left and also online gameplay on the right. So the experimental condition with statistically structured input categories was associated with behavioral learning outcomes. So what's the role of the striatum? To address this in more detail, let me come back to, this, to speech. In prior work, we examined the impact of incidental learning in the same video game with the same statistically structured non-speech categories. In this study, only with the experimental um, group. We focused on a putatively speech-selective region of the left posterior superior temporal sulcus gyrus region shown in gold. This region is more active um, and can be localized for words like duck um, than for semantically matched environmental sounds like a quack. So greater brain activation for a, a semantic a word spoken than for an environmental sound of the same semantic category. 
So naive listeners heard our non-speech sounds, the ones that you heard earlier, in a passive listening task. Um, they then left the scanner to train with the video game and learn statistically structured categories across those sounds for a period of about two weeks. And then they returned to the scanner for a post-test passive listening for these same exemplars. And what we see um, is that the subregion of this putatively speech-selective cortex is shown here in orange, was recruited more robustly in listening to our non-speech category exemplars after incidental category learning in the video game. In fact, the participants who exhibited the most robust behavioral evidence of category learning exhibited the greatest pre to post training recruitment of this region. These, those participants who best learned the categories recruited, recruited the region more in listening to them post training. So we replicated this finding in the present study that I've been telling you about so far. But here, since the learning took place in the scanner and not back at home in those two weeks that we'd sent these subjects home, we were able to look at what potentially might be driving these changes. So our hypothesis was that having identified this left posterior superior temporal sulcus region as, as a target of, of change from pre to post training, that there might, we hypothesize that the posterior striatum might be engaging with it um, in a functional circuit during learning. In fact, seed-based functional connectivity analyses revealed that the experimental and the control groups exhi exhibited significantly different patterns of connectivity between the posterior striatum and our left as a posterior superior temporal sulcus region in predicting sound category learning. Although the magnitude of the connectivity didn't differ between groups, there was a predictive pattern with categorization only for the experimental group. So this establishes the possibility of a functional circuit of the striatum with left posterior superior temporal cortex that supports the gradual accumulation of stimulus response relationships according to their alignment with the behaviorally relevant actions and events taking place across the primary task. To the extent that the striatum mediates learning and synaptic plasticity, there's a possibility for this cortical striatal loop to play a significant role in broadcasting information of task relevant cortical regions, including sensory cortex. The engagement of this loop has the potential to induce reorganization of cortical neural representations via learning above and beyond what might be possible from mere exposure alone. So we started this puzzle with some statistical structure that seems to be, at least in, in the laboratory, difficult to acquire through passive exposure alone, at least in the time periods that, that have been examined so far. But what we see is that those very same stimuli are rapidly acquired under conditions of incidental learning. And we've been able to present a candidate neurobiological network that might support this learning um, when time limitations or complexity outstripped the ability to passively accumulate statistical regularities. But I've strayed a bit from where we began. Um, in the interest of controlling listeners' histories of experience, I've so far steered us back to artificial non-speech sounds that are really, really far-fetched and not much at all like speech. Um, and so I want to just briefly return to that question that we started at with the submachine gun example. So, Speech category learning is inherently embedded in the challenges of segmentation learning. And something of a chicken and the egg problem. How do we learn regularities across units when we're simultaneously learning the units themselves? How do we know which bits of a continuous acoustic um, fluent input that's coming in that are going to count for a particular bin of statistics? And so um, we've been interested um, and addressing this issue, because for the most part, we've tended to study these two learning challenges in isolation, even though they're likely to be contemporaneous in, in development and in learning in general. So I'd like to show you just one example of how we're examining statistical learning with passive accumulation of statistics versus incidental learning in the context of continuous non-native speech. Adults play a video game um, with continuous non-native speech playing in the background. They're not instructed about the relevance of the speech to the game, and they're told to just do their best with the game despite the distraction. The studies I'll describe engage English listeners either with continuous Korean or Mandarin background speech with which they have no experience. Key to the design, uh, we define target non-native words and control non-native words. 
these two classes of words are equally frequent in the input. So the difference is that the target words are associated with behaviorally relevant actions and events. They are matched with a particular alien. In this Korean example, a particular Korean word, I'm going to call it target one, so as not to embarrass myself with Korean, is embedded at different sentence positions in running continuous speech. The different font is meant to indicate that each instance is acoustically distinct and thereby requiring that listeners discover the functional equivalence to learn a speech category. The sentences are presented across multiple male and female talkers, adding to the variability. So when this particular alien is headed for you, uh, continuous Korean with target one is embedded. In contrast, when this alien is on the way, continuous Korean with target two embedded is played. Note here that the alignment of the target words with aliens is really broadly defined. You're getting a paragraph level of speech coming in. There's an enormous sea of acoustic variability. The player has no a priori information that I as an experimenter have defined word as the relevant functional unit in this task. They don't have a listening window to listen in on, um, and even an indication that the speech matters. But amid this sea of variability, the statistically structured input that best aligns with success in the primary video game navigation task are the target word categories. So the control categories are just as well statistically structured, and they're just as equally frequent, but they don't have that benefit of behavioral alignment, even broad. Um, here, each control word is, is, is matched with each alien um, equally frequently. So control words one through four are each paired with this alien, for example, as they would for all other aliens. So we use EEG to spy on the auditory system's response to the continuous non-native speech before and after incidental learning in the video game. This is for reasons that we, it's very challenging to get a behavioral response output for the control words, where there really is no exact alignment. So in the EEG sessions, participants um, are simply passively listening to continuous non-native speech. We examine the cortical evoked responses time-locked to the onset of target and control words in continuous speech. And we focus our analysis on the large negative evoked potential typically apparent between about 80 and 120 milliseconds after stimulus onset. It tends to be distributed mostly over frontal central um, regions of the scalp, and it's thought to be generated by a network in the superior temporal gyrus. Motivating us to look at N1, prior work has demonstrated that its amplitude is exaggerated by selective attention. Um, and we wondered whether that acoustic pop-out that some of you experienced when you heard submachine gun in the otherwise incomprehensible speech might, have, um, might play out in this way with an uh, exaggerated N1 amplitude. <clears throat> Further work by Lisa Sanders and her colleagues has demonstrated that the N1 is exaggerated by word segmentation from fluent speech, giving us further reason to examine it here. So focusing on these three frontal central electrodes, I'm here plotting the average N1 amplitude um, uh, for the pre-training for both target and control words to point out that there were no significant pre-training differences in the N1 amplitude. There was no significant change in N1 amplitude from pre to post-training sessions for control words. Crucially, the N1 amplitude increased significantly for target words. Remember that the target and the control words were well-structured speech equally presented in the continuous input. Either had the opportunity to have their unique statistical structure be passively accumulated across time. But although the target and the control words had similar levels of variability and structure and were experienced equally often, the learning outcomes differed. After two and a half hours of training, the auditory evoked response for both the novel and the familiar exemplars from the target words exhibited a different neural signature than control words and one consistent with enhanced word recognition and perhaps selective attention based on prior literature. Where we have data, uh, behavioral data comes from the target words um, aligns with these ideas and that learning was robust and it persisted across the 10 days post training. It's possible then that the alignment of statistical regularities with behavior and an active task as for the target words provides something of an assist the statistical accumulation of regularities and hastens the learning process 
above and beyond what might be happen under conditions of passive accumulation of statistics alone. So this is not in any way to deny uh, learning across passive exposure or even across explicit instruction. Rather, it's to suggest that human listeners may possess additional learning systems capable of providing an active assist in the learning of statistically structure, structured input, perhaps hastening learning. The statistical input regularities matter, as I showed you. Small manipulations to them had a big impact on the extent to which this system was engaged in our task. But those stimuli best aligned with behavior and multimodal regularities, in as much as they possess statistical regularity, may get a boost relative to those that are not as well aligned. Let me emphasize that this alignment need not be particularly closely time-locked. In the latter experiment, listeners experienced this sea of continuous input with no a priori knowledge of what window of time is important to the task. Even the target words themselves have considerable variability across utterance and across talker, and yet they provide the best predictive control with which to guide successful behavior in the primary task. So let me wrap up by summarizing that we found that listeners can learn auditory categories incidentally and even in continuous speech, but that statistical structure and alignment with behaviorally relevant actions and events is deeply important in this learning. This learning differs from what we observe across passive exposure alone. The non-speech categories that we began with were not learned in 30 minutes of passive exposure, but they were readily acquired in 30 minutes within the incidental task. The non-native words embedded in the continuous task, but not aligned with behaviorally relevant actions, were learned differently than those that were. Moreover, we've found evidence that the striatum contributes to the uh, incidental auditory category learning. Significantly, modulations of striatal activity and its connectivity to the superior temporal regions um, in sensory cortices depend on whether the experienced sound categories are statistically structured so as to per permit their generalization. And finally, this learning scales to continuous speech. The work demonstrates that the striatal signals associated with incidental learning can serve to boost category learning above and beyond what might be accomplished via passive absorption of uh, environmental statistics alone. And so before turning things to questions, if Ram lets me, I, uh, I would like to take a moment to thank the many people who've been deeply involved um, in this line of research, most prominently my collaborators Fred Dick and Julie Fees, as well as um, Travis Wade, Charles Wu, Sungju Lim, and Yafi Gabe, who've contributed um, very substantially during their time in my lab. Um, so I thank you very much for your time and attention, and also to the organizers for bringing me here to this lovely city.